Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, wow, what a beautiful place. So nice to be here. The Majestic Theater in Boston. The uh, subject of this uh, special that I would like to present to the world is called The Power of Intention. The word intention, usually when we use this word, it has sort of a connotation meaning uh, nobody's going to get in the way. I intend for something to happen. I'm going to make this work no matter what. Regardless of whatever opposition I encounter, I intend to make it happen. It's like being a pit bull who's got a hole of a tire. Have you ever seen that? Uh, and they're just not going to let go. I'm going to have this pit bull attitude that I'm going to make something happen. That's what intention is. I'd like to offer here to you something that uh, may change the way you uh, look at things completely in terms of this uh, idea of intention. Rather than thinking of intention as something that uh, you are going to do, because the implication behind that is that this is the ego. This is the ego at work. And the part of me that says, I am going to make it happen. I've come to a place in my life now at the age of 63 where I finally realize that uh, I don't write the books, that there's an energy that is working through me whether you call it source or God or spirit, uh, it doesn't make any difference what you call it. But this energy that is working uh, builds all the bridges and writes all the books and delivers all the speeches. When I was standing back there waiting for the uh, introduction to come out and to begin this program, the words were running through my mind from something I read years ago in A Course in Miracles. It said, if you knew who walked beside you at all times, on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear or doubt again. You had this knowing that there was a source, that there was something that was available to you that is responsible for all of it. And in the writing of The Power of Intention, I remember sitting down to start this uh, book on a specific day, happened to have been Pearl Harbor Day, December the 7th. And, um, I sat down and I put my left hand on the table and I just surrendered and I let go and I allowed the words to flow through my heart and onto the page. And I don't write with a computer. I don't have one. Can't afford it. <laughs> I have eight children and they all need one for some reason. <laughs> and uh, I don't have, uh, you know, all of the fancy kinds of, I don't even have a typewriter. Um, I just allow the words to come through me onto the page. And as I was sitting there and uh, allowing this to happen, I began to realize that uh, there was something greater going on here. And as the days went by and as I wrote each day, getting up early in the morning, and, uh, and I've, I did this years and years ago when I first, uh, when I first started speaking. Um, I used to speak with notes and have everything all very carefully written out and so on. And there came a time when I could no longer do that. Um, I just had to speak from my heart which is exactly what I'm doing here with you today in this program. And when you surrender to this, when you begin to allow this force in the universe to work through you, you begin to realize that everything that shows up here in this world uh, shows up from a, a source, from a place, from, a, from an energy, from a field, whatever you want to call it, and that we and these these sort of piddly little egos of ours that believe that we're so important and whether I get it done right or whether I don't or whether I get it done on time or whether he does it or she does it or whatever, all of these details become uh, almost something that uh, occupy too much of the, uh, of the energy of our lives. And when you learn to surrender and to let go and to realize that intention isn't necessarily something that I do, but something that I connect to. And I'd like to share with you here at the opening a couple of observations, a couple of quotes that I came across as I was uh, preparing to write this book. Uh, the first of these quotes is from uh, a, a person who's been a very powerful and important influence in my life. His name was uh, Carlos Castaneda. And Castaneda, um, in his, particularly in his later books, in his book, uh, The uh, Fire from Within and The Power of Silence and uh, the active side of infinity, he spoke about intention not as something that we do, but as something that we connect to. 
I included this particular observation of Castaneda's in the writing of The Power of Intention because it was this particular quote that um, really inspired me to, to write this book and to produce this program and to be here with you today. And as like everything else in my life, I almost feel as if I'm no longer the one in charge. I don't even know how it was handed to me. Somebody just, and when I read the words, um, I had them laminated and I wrote them out and I, and I put, carried them around with me and ultimately knew I was going to write a book about them, about this idea, and I was going to produce a program about it. And here's what the quote says. In the universe, there is an unmeasurable, indescribable force which those who live of the source, in quotes, of the source. And of the source means sorcerer. Now, not sorcerer in the word, uh, when we think of sorcerer, we think of witches and incantations and uh, all kinds of hocus pocus and so on. That's not what the word sorcerer means. It means of the source. Those who live of the source. In the universe, there is an unmeasurable and indescribable force which those who live of the source call intention. And that absolutely everything that exists in the entire cosmos is attached to intent by a connecting link. And then he goes on to say, sorcerers are not only concerned with understanding and explaining that connecting link, but they are especially concerned with cleansing it of the numbing effects brought about by all of the concerns of living at ordinary levels of consciousness. Very important and powerful words to consider. Think of it like this, that everything in this universe was intended here, including you, including every mosquito and every palm tree and every avocado and all of the Rocky Mountains and the oceans, that everything that shows up in the material world emanates from a source. And this source can be thought of as that which intends things into the material world. And the question here today isn't whether or not you are going to be connected to it, because you couldn't be, you couldn't be listening to this program. You couldn't be processing what I'm saying here if you weren't connected to this field. This field beats your heart. This, this field of energy grows your fingernails and grows everybody else's fingernails. I used to say it, uh, it grows your hair, but I've become a little suspicious <laughs> of that, you know. But this, it animates all life. Now, this is one observation, that intention is what I'd like you to think of when I think about the power of intention. Intention isn't about whether you're going to connect to it. You're already connected to it. The question is, how rusty, how corroded, how dirty is the link between you and this field of intention? And sorcerers are those who are concerned with cleansing this connecting link so that you become more and more in rapport with or in harmony with this field of intention. And the more you're in harmony with this field of intention, the more you are able to do all that this field of intention is able to do. You are able to create miracles. You are able to heal yourself. You are able to attract into your life the abundance that has been missing. You are able to find the right people and have them show up exactly on time because that's how the universal source from which all things and all people originated, that's how it works. And what we're going to be doing here today in this program is looking at how to get that link back to intention and to not only be connected to it, but to always be ready to keep that connecting link clean, uncorroded. I came across another quote. Now, Castaneda is considered by many to be uh, a metaphysician, if you will, an anthropologist who got into the world of, uh, of sorcery and higher consciousness through what we call like spiritual uh, literature and so on. There's another man whose observations I came across that I want to share with you, and his name is Max Planck. Now, you may be saying, who is Max Planck? Max Planck was given 
the Nobel Prize in Physics many years ago in Stockholm for his work on the atom. He, along with Einstein, was considered to be one of the greatest scientific minds on the planet. Now these are the people who need hardcore data. They don't want to hear about hocus pocus and sorcerers and connecting to intention and all of these kind of things. It has to be something they can measure, they can see. These are the people who are what we call operating out of the left brain. And, and that is not in any way a criticism. It's something that allows us to make great scientific uh, explorations and advances, of course, as people. And the study of the atom is something that can be used not only to make atomic bombs, but it can also be used to power uh, all of the needs that we have on the planet for energy if it were put into the proper context. So here's what Max Planck had to say. As he accepted the Nobel Prize, these were his words. As a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you, as the result of my research about atoms, this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume, now listen to a greatest scientist on the planet, we must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Now, that is very, very powerful um, evidence. One of the things that really intrigues me is this idea, and I heard it many, many years ago. I'm not even sure of the original source where I heard it, but it goes like this. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Albert Einstein once observed that uh, you have the most fundamental and major decision that you have to make in your life is this. Do I live in a friendly or a hostile universe? Which is it? Is it a universe that is filled with hostility and anger and people wanting to hate each other and people wanting to kill each other? Is that what you see? Because when you see the world that way, that's exactly what you will create for yourself in your life. This is from great scientific minds. And the interesting thing is that this is not just a, a clever play on words, that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change, it's actually a very scientific thing, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. I'd like you to imagine the following scene. You're in your house. You've got your car keys in your hand. The lights go out. Power failure. You can't see a thing. You stumble around in your living room, and you drop your keys. And you look around for a moment and you realize that you're never going to find them in the dark. But you look outside and you notice that the street lights are on. So in your mind, a light bulb goes off. Hmm. I'm not going to sit around here in the dark and grope around looking for my keys when there's a light on outside. I'm going to go out here under the street light and I'm going to look for my keys. <laughs> Why are you laughing? This, is, this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> So you're out here, and you're groping around, and you're looking for your keys, and you're looking and looking, and your neighbor comes along and says, what happened, Wayne? Well, um, I dropped my keys. Oh, I'll help you look for them. And the two of us are now down here <laughs> looking for our keys. And looking. finally he says to me, excuse me, but um, where did you drop your keys? Well, um, I dropped them in the house. <laughs> he said, you mean to tell me that you dropped your keys in the house and you're looking for them out here in the street light doesn't make any sense. And I said, well, it doesn't make any sense to grope around in the dark when there's light out here. Now you laugh and you think how silly that is, but isn't that exactly what we do when we have a problem, a difficulty, a struggle that is located inside and we're looking for the solution outside? 
someplace outside of ourselves. It would be like going to the doctor and telling him all of your symptoms, and the doctor says, oh boy, you've got a lot of symptoms. And he starts writing out prescriptions. You need a prescription for this symptom, you need a prescription for that symptom, and finally he gets this four or five, and you go to walk out, and you say, well, I'd like my prescriptions. He said, no, 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 I'll give this one to your mother-in-law, and I'll give this one to your neighbor, and I'll give this one to your daughter, and I'll give this one to your father. I mean, you're the one with the struggles and with the difficulties, and giving, expecting somebody else to change or something outside of you to get better in order for you to make your life work at this level that I'm calling intention is something you have to really take a hard look at. It's in here. We have to see, the question isn't whether I'm connected to this field of intention. The question is, how ready am I to keep that connecting link absolutely corrosion-free. Now, I used to ask the question many years ago, from studying philosophy and teaching it for many years, who am I? Who am I? I'm pretty much at peace with that now. I really think that who I am is a, is a piece of the divine source, disguised as a, an author and a father and a writer and... Uh, uh, someone who uh, d delivers these kinds of uh, talks and, and so on. It's all a disguise. I remember when someone asked Mother Teresa, what do you do every day in the streets of Calcutta? She had a wonderful, profound answer. She said, every day I see Jesus Christ in all of his distressing disguises. I see the unfolding of source, the unfolding of God, the unfolding of spirit in all that I encounter. And I see it in myself as well. And I see that and know that. That's not the question that bugged me the most. The one that puzzled me the most is, where did I come from? Where did I come from? You ever ask yourself that question? I used to ponder that. I can remember I lived in a series of foster homes for a while when I was a young boy, until I was about nine. And I lay out, out in Mount Clemens, Michigan, I would lay out on the grass, and I would look up, and I'd see these endless stars. There was an apple orchard out there. And I could just lie there on my back, and I'd just look up, and I'd say, where did I come from? Where did I come from? And it's not about reincarnation. I always liked uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's response when they asked her if she believed in reincarnation. She said, uh, I don't think it would be any more bizarre for me to show up in another lifetime than it was for me to show up in this one. <laughs> It always kind of made sense to me. You know? It's hard to figure all of this out. But where did I come from? Where did I come from? So you ask yourself this perplexing question, where did I come from? And most of us, when we, when we think about that question, we come up with, uh, with an answer. And the answer is, as hard as it is for us to even imagine, our parents did it. <laughs> it's a tough one. But uh, in one blissful moment, one drop of human protoplasm in some mysterious way <laughs> collided with another, and life began at this, in this microscopic dot. Now, I used to, <laughs> I can remember years ago, we had, uh, we had four children in seven years. And um, my daughter, my teenage daughter, Stephanie, at that time, was, uh, well, she had to take on a lot of the helping responsibilities around the house when these babies just kept showing up. And we found out that we were going to have another child. Another mysterious uh, thing happened, and um, another child was on its way. And my wife and I flipped a coin to decide who would tell Stephanie. <laughs> and I lost. So I cornered her one day when she was in a really good mood. And I said, honey, you're not going to believe this, but uh, we're going to have another baby. Oh, that's great. And her hands went. <laughs> Instant pose. This is it. This foot here, this one out here. You know. That's terrific. I said, well, it really is. I said, and you should probably be glad that we didn't have the same attitude that you have when we found out about you. 
She said, yes, but how do you think it feels? I said, well, why don't you tell me? She said, no, Dad, how do you think it feels to be the only kid in junior high school who has parents who like to do it? <laughs> and I said, Steph, I know this is going to be hard for you to accept, but uh, Grandma and Grandpa do it. <laughs> that is just sick. That's all I got. Awesome. It's just storming out of there, right? So when we think about where we, came, we come from, that, that sort of is the place that we get to in our hearts. But just go back to that moment for a second and understand that, uh, remember what I said earlier, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Just keep that idea in mind. Because if you go back to the time of your absolute beginning into the material world, you know that there was a microscopic dot. And this microscopic dot included everything that you needed for this physical journey. And you can't even see it with a microscope. It's just, it's too, it's just too mysterious and too mystical to even contemplate, isn't it? That something as tiny as, a, as, a, as a, you could get a million of them on the head of a pin contains everything that you needed for this physical journey. Everything. Your birth was in there. The, the shape of your eye is in there. Your height is in there. The color of your skin is in there. The, uh, you know, I hold a hair up on the pillow and I say, and I've had this experience several million times. Uh, <laughs> what held it in yesterday? You know, what? <laughs> and you must ask that question, like, what held them up yesterday, don't you? Or, uh, why was it black yesterday and it's gray today? Where did that one come from or whatever? And all of these changes are in this microscopic dot. So what I'd like to do just for a few seconds here is to go back to take the microscopic dot that is your beginnings in which there's a future pull that is created every face and every body and everything in here and everyone out there watching today in that one instant miraculous moment, everything that you needed for this physical journey was in there. Too hard to comprehend, you just accept it. So now we take the dot, and we look at the dot, and we say, let's find the origin of the dot that began me. And you put it under a microscope, and you turn up the magnification, and what you see in, as you turn up this magnification is you see molecules. And inside of those molecules are mostly particles, and these particles are all flitting about, and there's mostly just empty spaces in there. And you take one of these particles out, and we call them atoms. And you put this atom, looking for your source, looking for where you began, and you put it under another atomic microscope, turn up the magnification even stronger, and what do you discover as you turn up the magnification? You discover that it's just more empty spaces and more particles with new names. Protons, electrons, neutrons, protons, whatever you want to call them, right? <laughs> we memorized them in junior high school, right? So you take one of these electrons, and you're still, you're just looking for your source. Where did I come from? You turn up the magnification on this electron microscope, and what do you see? More spaces and more particles, all flitting about a dance, this huge dance. And you take one of those, and you turn up the magnification, and what you have are new particles with new names called quarks. We're now looking at quantum physics, the study of the behavior of matter at the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest levels. And we're just looking for our source. So finally, we take one of those quarks. And these quarks are really weird. My friend Deepak Chopra has often said to me, Wayne, he said, quantum physics is not only stranger than you think it is, it's stranger than you can think. <laughs> because at, you take a tiny little subatomic particle and observe it, and the fact is that the nature of your observing changes what you're observing. If you look at it in a certain way, it becomes one thing. If you turn away, it becomes something else. It's truly a scientific fact that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And now you take this tiny little subatomic particle, and you take it and you put it in a particle accelerator, and you rev up the uh, the speed of these things and collide them at 250,000 miles per hour. Shh, you collide them, you open up the particle accelerator looking for your source, and guess what's in there? 
nothing, no thing, that the dot that began you originated from a field of energy that has no boundaries, no beginnings, no ends. It's infinite. It's an infinite potential. And the question that I have for you is, if you can get this, that you didn't begin with that particle because particles themselves do not create more particles. St. Paul put it this way in the New Testament, that which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. They talked a little strange in those days, right? Huh? <laughs> what that means is the everything that we see in the material world doesn't originate in the material world. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. If the shape of your eye can be in an energy field that has no boundaries, no form, no materialness to it, why not the shape of your life? Why not the, everything that you are destined to become, why can't that be a part of this energy field as well? That you showed up here from a field that I call intention. And that beautiful globe that is here to my left, to your right, is what I am going to call, for the rest of this program, I am going to call this the source from which we all originated. That every particle that shows up on this planet, and that's what Max Planck said, and that's what Carlos Castaneda said, and that's what every metaphysician said, that's what all of the great spiritual teachings on this planet say, that our source is spirit. It is something other than the physical. And if you had a set of magical binoculars, and you could look at that field, what I'm going to describe in this program is what that field would look like. And my suggestion to you here is this, that you are going to, if you want to understand intention and the power of intention, it means suspending your ego, the part of you that believes that you are separate from this source, because that's where all of our problems originated, all of our struggles, even our illnesses. This is a source of well-being. Everything that emanates from this source emanates from a field of well-being. It looks like something. It sounds like something. One of the things that it sounds like, I took from one of the great spiritual traditions in the universe. It's from uh, the Bhagavad Gita, what is called the Hindu holy book, the Song of the Lord. But you can look in any spiritual tradition, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Judaism, whether it's Zoroastrianism or whatever, and basically they all say the same thing. If, if this source that we call God or soul or spirit, if it could speak, this is what it would sound like. And then later on, I'm going to talk to you about what it looks like. What does it look like? I am the source of all material and spiritual worlds. Everything emanates from me. That's what it sounds like. Everything emanates from me. So that means you. And that's why the words, with God, all things are possible, means that when you find in your heart a way to reconnect to this, and remember what I talked about in those opening quotes, that this field of intention is a field that is... Um, only corroded because we take on something that separates us from the source. And that is called the ego. And the ego is really nothing more than an idea that we carry around. It's the source of virtually all of our problems. The only difficulty is you can't check into a, uh, into a hospital. Like if you've got an appendix problem, you check in, get an appendectomy. There's no place that I know of that gives egoectomies. It would be nice, <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. So that what you want to do is figure out a way to get rid of this idea that who I am is separate from this. And this is your source. And when you reconnect to your source, live in harmony with your source, you are connecting to the field of intention. And when you're with this field of intention, everything that this field of intention from which all material worlds emanate 
Everything that it can do, you can do because you are it and it is you. The problems that we have is we've come to a place where we believe that we are separate from it. And so we start to believe that I am what I do. And I am what I have. And I am separate from everybody else. And I am my reputation. And I'm separate from what is missing in my life. But this field from which all things originate, if it's everywhere, it's got to be in you. And if it's everywhere and it has to be in you, it has to also be in everything that you perceive to be missing from your life. It has to be in that too, because there's no place that it's not. And if there's no place that it's not, you literally are already connected to everything that you would like to attract into your life. What keeps you from doing it is your belief that you're separate from your source. We want to reconnect to this source. People ask me the question, what about a free will? If I was intended here, and the shape of my life was intended here from this source, um, where does that leave me with a free will? Well, where it leaves you with a free will is this. You have a free will to decide whether or not you are going to connect or not connect to that source. That's your free will. If you make a choice, a conscious choice, to stay disconnected from it and believe that you are all of these things that I just illustrated in the ego, this field of intention doesn't know anything about non-well-being. It creates from a source of well-being. It doesn't know anything about um, fear, about anxiety, about worry. It just is in a constant state of creating. There's a quotation that goes like this. Self-realization, which is really reconnecting to your source. Self-realization means that we have been consciously connected with our source of being. We are reconnected to this source, which I'm going to describe in detail in this program, what I believe the faces of intention look like. Once we have made this connection, then absolutely nothing can go wrong. That's from Swami Paramananda. Nothing can go wrong when you reconnect to source. All of our struggles, all of our illnesses, all of the scarcities in our life, all of the problems we have in our relationships, all of this stuff came about because we disconnected ourselves from a field of intention that is nothing but just well-being at work. It only wants you to be in a state of happiness. I said in a book that I wrote many years ago called Gifts from Micahs, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. You're not going to find it in something outside of you. It is, and it's like when you understand this and get this, connecting to intention means something that's very powerful to you. There's an observation that I came across in the writing of uh, Power of Intention by a man who gave a lecture, I, I'm not sure the exact year, but it was in the early 1900s. His name was Thomas Troward. And he gave a series of lectures on mental science at the Ed Edinburgh in Scotland, called the Edinburgh and Dory Lectures. And one of those observations, one of those quotations was this. I really love this. He said, the law of flotation was not discovered by the contemplation of the sinking of things. Isn't that great? Imagine yourself trying to figure out, you know, what he made an observation that before about the 15th or 16th centuries, um, all of the ships in the world were made out of wood. And why do you think they made ships out of wood for so many centuries? Because when you put wood in water, what happens? It floats, and our conclusion was, the law of flotation must be, you want things to float, make them out of things that float. But now, we have realized that in studying the law of flotation, that it has nothing to do with what the material is made of, it has to do with the amount of water that is being displaced. So now, all the ships of the world are made out of stuff that doesn't float, and yet they float. We're celebrating now, at this time in our history, uh, 
the flights, uh, the 100 year anniversary of uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright over in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Imagine the law of flight being, being discovered by someone, by two brothers, contemplating the staying on the ground of things. <laughs> <laughs> so what we want to do is figure out a way uh, to reconnect ourselves to surrounding ourselves with this, um, with this idea that we are already connected to everything that we need for everything in our life. We've just separated ourselves by believing that we're something that we're not. In a book that I wrote a few years back called The Ten Secrets for Success and Inner Peace, which was, the, which was part of a PBS special, one of those secrets is called treasuring your divinity. Treasuring your divinity. And I came across this observation, and I was writing some notes on what I'm just talking about, on contemplating things. Listen to these words. We know that by the very nature of the creative process, which is what intention is about, learning to create the life that you want, the world that you want, the people that you want, the excitement that you want, the health that you want, everything. We know that by the very nature of the creative process, that we are one with this originating spirit. And therefore, we are also one with all of its principles. Whatever this is like, whatever it sounds like, whatever it thinks like, whatever it looks like, we are one with it. And consequently, we are one with its infinite personality. We are not here as human beings having spiritual experiences. We are all spiritual beings having human experiences. All of us. We are all infinite. And therefore, our contemplation of this, this source, as the power which we want, gives us the ability to use that power. And the way that we use this process is to contemplate ourselves as surrounded by the conditions which we want to produce. Keep that in mind. Underline that. Surround yourself internally with the conditions. Contemplate them which you want to produce. What is it you want to produce in your life? What do you intend to create for yourself? It's not your ego that's going to do it. It's your free will to reconnect to this, which is the source of everything. You're going to be, by the end of this program, you're going to be in rapport with, in harmony with this. If you call my cell phone, pick up the phone, I don't mind to give that number, but uh, <laughs> if you were to call this number, this is what you would get as a message from me. Hi, this is Wayne Dyer that you've reached. And I want to feel good. If your call is designed to do anything other than that, <laughs> you have reached the wrong number. <laughs> and I urge you to call Dr. Phil. But feeling good is perhaps the most important thing that I can talk to you about here in cleaning up this link. If you open up the Torah, this ancient spiritual text, the Old Testament, and go to the very opening lines, Genesis 1.1, it says, what? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Pretty simple. God is infinite. Out of this source came all the material worlds. And then if you read down 31 lines later, it says, and all that God created was good. So good and God are synonymous, aren't they? Good and God, just an O, just one extra O. So that when you say, I want to feel good, as you'll see as this program unfolds, you're really saying, in a way, I want to feel God. I want to feel whatever this beautiful source of all, this divine mind, this source of all things, I want to feel what it feels. Now you might say to yourself, yeah, it's easy to say I want to feel good, but uh, how can I feel good when so much around me is bad? How can I feel good if my sister-in-law has cancer? 
And how can I feel good if I know that over on the other side of this planet there are people who are starving to death? And how can I feel good if there are people who are poor and I have money and there are people who are starving and how can I feel good when my children act in the way that they act? Or how can I feel good? And I suggest to you that when you say I want to feel good, what you're saying is I want to feel God. I want to feel this. I want to connect here. And I want to offer this to you as a very important and powerful piece of advice that came to me years ago. You cannot get sick enough to heal one person on this planet. And you cannot get poor enough to make one person wealthy on this planet. And you cannot get confused enough to unconfuse one person on this planet. No amount of your feeling bad, when you say feeling bad, what you do is you lose your connection to source. And when you lose your connection to source, what happens is you create something called resistance. I can't do this. It's not possible. I, I don't deserve it. This is, it's just not something that I can do. I, and when you create this kind of resistance, you have emotions. And these emotions become sadness, fear, worry, anxiety. And what I'd like to offer you is a way for you to use these emotions that you are experiencing at any time in your life and use them as a system, as a, as a, as a barometer, as a guidance system to say to yourself, what kinds of thoughts am I having that are keeping me from being in rapport with this field of intention? And at any moment that you're not feeling good, you are attracting exactly the opposite of what it is that you would like to attract into your life. You are using this as a way to keep yourself from feeling God or feeling good. If you are listening to the news, and the news is filled with all of the reasons why you should be depressed, and it's not an accident that then they are sponsored by all of the reasons why you should take these uh, narcotics or these pills or whatever it is in order to get over. So here's some depression, and wait a minute, we'll be right back. Here's a way out of it, okay? <laughs> I saw a commercial the other day. I don't even know what it was for. Some guy gets up in the morning, and he's going out to get clams. And he's going out clamming in the morning. And, he's, uh, and he, he's successful at getting the clams. He walks off and he's got his clams. And I think, and then they say, call your doctor to see if you need some of this clam finding miracle drug. There's a drug out there that'll help you find clams if this happens to be one of your problems. Right? And there's, there's something out there, and now we're being told to call our doctors. The, do I need the orange pill, the green pill, the purple pill? Do I need this one? I saw so-and-so reading it, and she was skating on the ice, and I want to skate on the ice. And, and, and it's like it's an endless progression of this. It's one of the reasons that I put so much of my energy into public television. Because when I watch the evening news, when I watch Jim Lehrer in the, on the evening news on PBS, which is the only news that I watch, uh, I don't get bombarded with all of the reasons why, and I also get sort of a either side of this thing. I don't just get a one-sided view of, and it's like, it's an energy system. I'd like to say to you here that my idea about connecting to in intention um, has certain obstacles to getting there. And I just want to very briefly go through what those obstacles are and then move into what it is that you need to do to understand what this field looks like and what you can do to stay connected to it. Keeping in mind these words, I want to feel good. I know my beautiful daughter who will be singing in a little while, uh, Skye, she was working on a music project. And uh, she had come to me and she said, would you mind, she was going to school at the University of Miami. And she said, Dad, would you mind if I dropped out of school? And since I have been a person who has never, ever listened to any advice that adults ever gave me throughout my life <clears throat> about what I should do with my life because I believe it's something that you have to own yourself. Um, I said, why? And she said, well, I want to sing. I've always just wanted to sing. It's the only thing that's in my heart is singing. And what I've discovered, she said, is that I can't sit in classrooms anymore in my junior year and, um, and be told how to sing by people who are not singing. And she said, I also don't want to study theory any longer. I want to sing. I just feel it in my heart. I said, that's great. I said, I'd like to take you with me when I, when I 
uh, talk all over the country, all over the world. And I'd like you to sing for me because I'm always so proud to have her on stage with me, as you'll see why shortly. And I said to her, I said, honey, but what you've got to do is perhaps put together a, a project, perhaps put together a CD, get some way that you can come out and sing at the talks and include on this some of the music uh, that is relevant to what I speak about. <clears throat> and she said, okay. And I was over on Maui and I was writing. And uh, she called me, she said, Dad, the problem is that the musicians that I need to be able to do this um, are not available. And you can't get them. And I said, Sky, you've got to contemplate yourself as surrounded by the conditions which you wish to produce. Don't think about the musicians as not being available. Contemplate yourself surrounded by the musicians and you'll see that when you reconnect to this source, this source will provide. It always does. It's an, uh, an unfailing system. It's, a, it's fail safe. She said, all right, all right, you're dad the dork, you know. <laughs> she called me back the next day. She said, you're not going to believe this, dad. I did what you said last night, and all the musicians are available. I just can't believe it. She said, they called the ones that I wanted, especially they had a cancellation on something. She said, the only problem is that the studios that I need in order to be able to record it <laughs> are unavailable. There's no studios available in any place in South Florida, and I wanted good, and I want to get this in, and I had given her a deadline of like four days to get this done, <laughs> an entire CD. So uh, she called me back and uh, she said, how do I get a studio? I said, Sky, contemplate yourself as surrounded by the conditions which you wish to produce. The law of flotation was not this guy, all right, I got it with the flotation, okay? <laughs> she called me back the next morning. She said, Dad, it's a miracle. She said, the studios had a cancellation, and the, two, the studio that I really need and the musicians, they're all available. I can put the whole thing together. It's so exciting. This stuff really works. I said, of course it does. She said, the only problem is <laughs> that it costs quite a bit of money to pay these musicians and to have the studio time. I said, Sky, honey, you've got to contemplate yourself <laughs> as surrounded by the conditions which you want to produce. She said, that's why I'm calling you. And I said, but honey, I want to feel good. <laughs> she said, maybe you should call Dr. Phil. <laughs> she said, and this will make you feel good because you will be contemplating yourself as surrounded by a daughter who is so, she used it all right back on me. <laughs> and she did it and she got it done and she was able to, to produce it. And you know, it sounds like a silly little example, but it's like the obstacles that we have to creating what we want very often are in the ways that we perceive ourselves as disconnected here. And every thought that you have that says, I can't do it, is resistance to connecting to source. And every thought that you have that says, it's never worked before, that's resistance to connecting to this source, to what is being, what I call vibrating through source energy, getting back to your, having your desires, what you want to create in vibrational harmony with this highest energy in the universe. The obstacles that we have, most of us are, there's three of them. The major one is the ego, which I talked about earlier. You have to learn to stop being offended. There are people out there who are going through life looking for occasions to be offended, and you very seldom will find yourself disappointed. <laughs> and if you don't like the way uh, somebody's dressed, that's a way to be offended. If you don't like the language that they use, I, one of the things I do is I, I run in hallways. Uh, when I'm traveling on the road. Because I like to do my running every day, but I don't like to, if it's very cold or very hot, I don't like to have to carry a lot. So I just carry a pair of, of shorts. And I run up and down the hallway like this. I run here and I run up and down and I get an hour, and I get an hour of running out there in the hallways of hotels. Now there are people behind the doors very often who don't anticipate a sweaty man in the running on the hallway. And there are times when the doors will open and I'll be running and I'll hear someone walk by, what is that guy doing? What's wrong with him? Doesn't he know that there's a track? This isn't the place. And he's using my experience out here as a reason to be offended. And he's still on the way down. He's, he's yelling at his wife about the fact that I shouldn't be there. Oftentimes uh, goes home, kicks the cat, whatever it is. Because... <laughs> but one day I was running and there's a, there's a different view of it as well. It's very interesting. Because I was r running in the hallway one time and the door opened, and a woman had to be 92, 93 years old. So it was in Little Rock, Arkansas. And she opened up, opened up the door, and I was running right past her. She had a little walker. She said, young man, 
I immediately love this lady. Huh? <laughs> she said, what the hell are you doing? I said, well, ma'am, I said, and I stopped, I was running in place. I said, I just like to get my heart rate going up there. It's really good, and I didn't want to go outside because it's very hot out there today. She said, you got that much energy this time of the morning to be out there running? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, why don't you come on into this room with me for a little while? <laughs> now, there's a woman who had a great sense of humor. With the same, she wasn't looking for an occasion to be offended. How many times do you find yourself doing that? Or stopping yourself from feeling superior, or from needing to be right, or from needing to win, or from needing more, or to achieve, or to be concerned with your reputation. All of these have nothing to do with source energy. All of that has to do with this identity that you've taken on that says, I am, all of these accomplishments are what I do. That's one. The second of these obstacles is what I call the energy of your life. Everything in the universe has energy. Everything. That's why I promote a book so powerfully called Power Versus Force by David Hawkins, a medical doctor out in, uh, in Sedona, Arizona, where he talks about the, the thoughts that we have and how you can use kinesthesiology, you can just use muscle tests to determine whether something works or doesn't work for you and whether it's strong or not. And every thought that you have, if you have, and he has compartmentalized all of these different thoughts, and it's like he even suggested that the music that we listen to has energy in it. The photographs that we have hanging in our home, the prayers that we have, and the television shows that we watch, there is very low energy out there. The average child in America has already seen 12,000 murders, simulated murders, in his living room on cable and commercial television before his 14th birthday. Imagine, imagine, 12,000 simulated murders. You never see that on public television. That's why I'm here doing this for public television. Because it's a place where you are not allowed to send that kind of energy out. So my son, I was over on, over on Maui, and I was, uh, we were there for the summer, and all of a sudden I hear this crazy music going, playing throughout the whole place. And it's some kind of gangster thing, and wanting to kill people, and loud, loud swearing, and all of this. I said, Sands, what is this? What are you listening to? He said, Dad, it's really cool, man. This is rap. This is really, you know, it's like... 16, you know. I said, go get the CD. And this is something that I read in Power Versus Sport. He said, what do you mean? I said, go get the CD. Now, he's a big, strong, 16-year-old, uh, strapping kid, six foot tall, you know, very muscular, and <clears throat> a lot of testosterone. And uh, so he, uh, he brings the CD, and he said, what do you want me to do with this? I said, well, set it on the table, and take that banana. And I had some bananas there. I said, take that organic banana, place it next to your heart, put your arm out, and what I'd like you to do is uh, resist me as hard as you can with that banana next to your heart. And he did, and I couldn't, I put two fingers on, I couldn't budge his arm. I said, now take that CD and put that next to your heart. He took the CD with the energy in it. As hard as this is to imagine for yourself, you can try this in your own work. And he held that next to him, and he became powerless to my two fingers pushing down on his arm. The energy weakened him. The energy of the foods that we eat, the shows that we watch, the people that we uh, surround ourselves with. Even the thing, you know, most of you know that I'm a camel. And a camel is an animal that starts out every morning on his knees and he goes to bed every night on his knees and he can go 24 hours without a drink. And that's something that I do every day. I go 24 hours without a drink. And it isn't because I labeled myself as an alcoholic or anything like that. I was told by a very powerful and important teacher that if you want to reach the levels that I would like you to be able to understand, where you can literally do a somersault into the inconceivable and see yourself as capable of attracting and healing and being able to create abundance, if you want to be able to be all that you can be, he said, you've got to stop putting substances into your body that are uh, deteriorating the body and, and deleterious to the health of your body. And he said, alcohol just happens to be one of those things. So I don't take a particular moral position on it. I did it because I didn't want that energy into my life. So look at the energy of your life, the places that you accumulate, the friends that you have, the people that find fault with what you're doing. Look at all of uh, the, uh, the way, even, even a simple little thing like feng shui, which is a Chinese form of how you, how you arrange the furniture 
in your, it's, it's, so, it's so cool, but I've got a lady who works with me over in Maui, and every time I go away, she'll come back, and she'll have this thing moved over here, and this thing over there, and I'll say, but, I, you know, I like this here, this is where I shave. No, 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 the, the feng shui of that isn't quite right, and you, have, you don't want to have a red next to you. I just listen to her. My place is one of the most pleasant and beautiful places. Of course, having it on the ocean has a, a lot to do with it as well. <laughs> but I believe that energy is in everything. Change the energy of your life and reconnect to the energy of spirit. Spiritual energy is healing energy. Spiritual energy, as you'll see, is the energy of abundance. So now, the third thing is, as an obstacle, we looked at ego, <coughs> we've looked at our energy, and also the way that we talk to ourselves. How do you talk to yourself? If you think, here's one of my favorite quotes, the creative source, the creative source in your life, here it is right here, this creative source, this source reacts to your belief in shortages with a fulfillment of your belief. If you believe there's shortages out there and you can't attract them into your life, now this is a source that is unlimited abundance. It just is a constant state of creating. It's always creating, okay? So it doesn't know anything about shortages. If you come to this source with a belief that you, there are shortages in terms of your life, it will fulfill your belief. If you believe that you can't be healed, that it's just impossible for you to be healed, if you believe you can't be happy, if you believe that you have to be miserable, if you believe that you can't attract the right person, if you've got something that you want to fund, some project that you want to fund, and you can't get it funded, and you come to this source with a belief in shortages, it will fulfill your belief. It only knows how to be. Remember what I said earlier. You are at one with this, and you are also at one with all of its principles. And you have to contemplate yourself as connected to, in harmony with, in rapport with, this. It's like there's a game that's been on television for years. It's called the match game. And this match game is a, it's a, it's a fun little game to watch because you get people who you really think know each other, and they, try, they say something and they try to match it up. You're always in a, you want to get into a match game yourself. And the match game you want to be into is one in which you match up with this source. You're going to always try to be matched up with that. What I'm asking you to do in this program, in an understanding intention and the power of intention, I'm asking you to see yourself at every moment of your life when you're having a thought, when things aren't working, when you're not feeling well, when the right people aren't there. You could say something to yourself. I heard people say this, you know, that I tell people always, think from the end. Think from the end. So I was talking to a man one day down in the, where I work out in the, in the gym, and I said to him, he's been sick, he's got nose running, he's got, you know, Snoopy's running out of his nose, he's got, uh, it's disgusting. And uh, I said, how long, how long have you been sick, Marty? You will never believe this answer. He said, in three weeks, it'll be a month. <laughs> is that? <laughs> I was changing plane in Dallas one time, and uh, uh, there was about eight minutes to go before I had to make a connection, and the woman next to me, she said, uh, I said, I'd, I'd, really, uh, I'd really appreciate if I could just step in front of you because I'm going to make my connection. She said, you're going to have to change trains and, and, and get to another terminal. She said, there's no way that you can make your connection. She's still in Dallas. <laughs> I think from the end, I see myself as already connected to that which I want to attract into my life. And if it doesn't work out for some reason, I don't, get, I don't use blame, I don't get anger, I, don't, I just simply say to myself, this is the way it is supposed to be. And I'm at peace with it. I choose to be at peace because this is peace. You want to watch the resistance. What kind of self-talk do we have? If you think about what is missing in your life, and you talk to other people about what is missing in your life. And you share a lot with what's missing in your life. <gasps> I'm missing the right person. My soulmate has never showed up. You know? <laughs> I'm missing the money. I don't have the money. And you talk about all the things that are missing in your life. 
you are, here's your connection to source. Remember, you're always connected. The question is, are you ready to stop living at ordinary levels of consciousness? Are you start willing to live at a spiritual level of consciousness in which you are in rapport with that which provides everything? So if you're thinking about what's missing and you go to this universal source asking to have fixed what is missing in your life, you'll have the, your belief in what's missing continue to be refocused for you. In the Old Testament it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. If you think about what is missing, don't be surprised if you keep attracting what's missing into your life. If you think about what always has been, then don't be surprised if what always has been is what keeps showing up in your life. Because thoughts are energy. And the thought of it's always been this way and there's nothing I can do, resistance. What emotion am I feeling? Frustration. I want to change that. What is my guidance system? I'm going to see how in harmony am I with this energy of source, with the energy of intention. How in harmony with it am I? The source of, of, of all doesn't know anything about things being missing. There's nothing missing in this universal source. And you emanated from that. You are a piece of that. If you're always thinking about what they want for you, and there's no shortage of them, they're called relatives. <laughs> I'm going to write a book someday that's going to be called Your Friends Are God's Way of Apologizing for Your Relatives. <laughs> Why? Because, by the way, I gave this same talk to your relatives and they applauded even louder. <laughs> Because a friend is someone before whom you can think aloud. A friend is not someone who makes demands on you and tells you what you should be doing or what you shouldn't be doing. There are very often, because we believe that we're related to people, we have talk, and then what happens with us is that we start talking to other people about what they want for us. And we despise what they want for us. We get angry at them for even wanting that for us. And then we get surprised when what they want for us keeps showing up. See, self-actualizing people, Abraham Maslow once said, the difference between self-actualizing people, the highest functioning people, and everybody else is that self-actualizing people must be what they can be. Self-actualizing people must be what they can be. What can you be? What can you be? And I'd like to suggest to you that if you look, I'm going to take a pair of magical binoculars now. Now, I'm going to take these binoculars, and I'm just going to assume that I am now looking through this, these magical binoculars at my source, where I came from. The question I ask at the very beginning, where did I come from? The answer to that is, I came from a field of energy, and a particle was formed out of that field that became everything I needed for this physical journey. My birth and my death were all in there. My height, the color of my skin, the hair falling out, all of the things that are taking place in this physical body were all handled there. But they were also handled before that source hit the world of material. And when I shift and understand that what I came from, what I'm looking for here, I'm looking to see what does it look like? What does this look like? I call these in the book, in The Power of Intention, I call them the faces of intention. The seven faces of intention. And any time in your life when you are not in harmony with these seven faces, you are stopping the miraculousness, the miracle, the mystical mystery that you are that not only decided the shape of your eye before it became a particle, but decided the shape of your life as well. You came here from a field of energy that has no limits. The first of these seven faces is called the face of creativity or creation. And I suggest to you that there's an intention, and intention is one of the chapters here. It is, it is my intention to live my life on purpose. Here is the source. So beautiful. This is where I emanated from. And this source is always creating. And you as a being 
who has emanated from that but has taken on an ego has what I call summoning power or pulling power. You can pull from this source and be what it is, or you can have resistance to it. How much summoning power do you have? How much of this source are you able to summon? When you are on purpose and creating in your life, one of the great teachers in my life was a man named Patanjali. And he had an observation about uh, being in spirit. The word in spirit creates a word called inspire. And Patanjali put it this way. He said, when you are inspired in spirit, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction, and you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world. And then he said something so powerful. He said, dormant forces, like forces that you didn't think were accessible to you, dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Those words bring tears to my eyes. They're so powerful. When you are inspired, when you are in spirit. When you're in spirit, you are creating. When you are creating, everything is working. My teacher in India one time, Nisargadatta Maharaj, said when he was asked the question, there's wars going on in Pakistan, there's people having difficulties here, there's people, there's people dying, there's starvation. How can you say that I can heal myself and, that, and how can you be at peace when you see all of this going around? And you know what he said to his devotee? He said, in my world, nothing ever goes wrong. What a powerful idea that is. You can't get sick enough to heal those people who are sick around you. You can't get poor enough to take care of the lack of abundance in so many people's lives. The only thing you can do to help that, as I'll be talking about a little later, is to connect to this. You know, when I was 19 years old, I joined the Navy right after high school in 1958. And I was going overseas to um, get, uh, c connect to my ship after having gone to school. And I was standing at the dock boarding a ship called the USS Vega, which is a refrigerator ship, which was taking me across the Pacific Ocean in 29 days to meet the USS Ranger, an aircraft carrier at that time, the largest ship in the world, and I was assigned to it. And it was docked in a place called Yokosuka, Japan. And I took a boat, this refrigerator boat, over to Sasebo in southern Japan, got on a train, 19 years old, and was going to catch my boat 29 days later. 19-year-old kid. And as I got on the boat, Never having been on such an adventure before, my Uncle Bill, who was a school teacher in Hayward, California, one of my heroes, one of the reasons why I'm here today is because of my Uncle Bill Volley, um, he handed me a book. And it was a collection of short stories by a man named Leo Tolstoy. He said to me, as he handed it to me, he said, read The Death of Ivan Illich by Leo Tolstoy. And The Death of Ivan Illich is a story of a man very, very quickly who uh, was a judge in Moscow. And he went back and forth every day to work, and he hated his work, and he hated his life, and he hated his wife. And he hated everything about what he was doing. And he got to the end of his life, and he was lying on his deathbed, and he looked up at his wife, who was holding his hands, and he looked into her eyes. And I was 19 when I read this, and it still gives me goose flesh. He said to her as he died, what if my whole life has been wrong. Oh. <laughs> and I took out a pad of paper and I wrote down my first of my 10 secrets for success in Interface. And I started a journal at that time and it said, Dear Wayne, don't die <laughs> with your music still in you. Don't die with your music still in you. I would suggest to you, if you are not creating, and if you wonder what your purpose is, and so many people wonder, what is my purpose? And they talk to me, I don't know what my purpose is. You know what that is? Your thoughts about your purpose are your purpose trying to reconnect to you. <laughs> like if you want to quit smoking, and people say, oh, it's such a hard thing to do. Well, of course, that's resistance. And then, you know, who wants to do hard things when easy things like smoking are available? Um, <laughs> 
But if you, and, and people say, well, I've been thinking about it. I said, keep thinking about it. Just keep thinking. You want to lose weight? Keep thinking about it. Put your attention on it. Surround yourself with those kind of thoughts because the thinking about it process is a part of your connecting to it. Eventually, you will connect to it and you will begin to act upon what those thoughts are. But you've got to start by thinking about it. And the ultimate purpose you can have in your life, I used to have a jacket that uh, I hung on my uh, closet door. And the, and, the, and the jacket had all of the uh, uh, <coughs> pockets ripped off. I took a razor blade to all the pockets. Because someone had once said to me that the last jacket you wear doesn't need any pockets. <laughs> so, because you're not taking anything with you in your pockets, all right? <laughs> So every time I'd walk into my closet and I'd look at this tattered jacket with no pockets in it, it was a reminder. You're going to have to wear a jacket someday that doesn't need any pockets, all right? And that what, so what do you do with your life? Your life is like a parenthesis in eternity. You show up from an infinite source. You materialize. You're a particle. Everything you needed for this life is in it. And then you close parentheses. What can you do with your life? You can't take anything with you. You came from nowhere, N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E. You show up in now here, N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E. It's all the same, just a question of a little spacing. And where do you think you're going? Back to, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you're going nowhere. From nowhere to now here to nowhere, it's all the same. The only thing you can do with your life is give it away. When people say to me, what is it that I can do with my life? What is my purpose? My answer is always the same. Find a way to be of service. Find a way, whatever it is. It doesn't matter if you're serving ice cream cones in, uh, in Alaska. It doesn't matter if you're raising horses in Montana. It doesn't make any difference. Whether... I had a woman come to me one time who wanted to adopt a child in Moldova. I had to look it up, I didn't, Moldovia. She saw this little face on a, on a, on a program on the, one of the uh, stations there, I think it was on a PBS station, and she couldn't get that face out of her. her. She became in purpose, on purpose. She began to live her life on purpose. She went to Moldovia and brought home her little son. And it's like, whatever it is when you are of service, if you're giving your life away, and if you don't know how to do that, you, you suspend your ego. You, you understand that living on purpose means there's no accidents. That you are aligning yourself with purpose. You ignore other people when they tell you what you should be doing. That's what Ivan Illich didn't do. You just ignore it. You don't have to have a fight about it. You can say, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. It's very helpful. I've never thought of that before. <laughs> I'll consider that. That's how you handle all conflict. Can I join up with this source energy, or can't I? The two, as soon as you start striking out, you're off of purpose. You have to contemplate yourself, surrounded by the conditions you want to produce. That's the first phase of intention.